Hi, welcome back to my channel. As I like to say, it's always something, and the something that's happened to pop up this time is on my girlfriend's 2006 Toyota Tundra pickup truck 4.7 V8. A couple weeks back, she was leaving her place of business, and she called me on the phone and says, hey, I can't get the truck to, to go above like 20 or 30 miles an hour. There's something wrong with it. It's February. It's cold around here. She gets home. I'm not in a hurry to look at it. So the truck sat for a week or so. I get out a Saturday morning. Maybe it was a Sunday morning. I don't know. I get in the truck, start it. Starts fine. Go down the driveway, get on the road, and I try to accelerate, and it's just like she said. I can't get the truck above maybe 25 miles an hour, and it's not shifting because I don't think the speed's getting up enough to cause the transmission to shift to the next gear. I get on the road maybe about a mile. Uh, I can't figure this thing out. I do notice though, when I put my foot to the floor, this thing appears to be rev limited. It's not getting up above any more than, I think it was 4,000 RPM, if even that. So I get back, park a truck, go look for my OBD2 uh, Wi-Fi scan tool, and of course, she's got it in her car, so I can't do anything. I pop the hood, look at what I can look at. I don't see anything obvious underneath the hood. Close the hood. Later on today, she comes home. I got my scan tool, hook up my scan tool, and decide to take the truck for a drive to see what's going on. Go down the road and everything works fine. It just fixed itself. So I kind of thought, well, I got other things to do during the day. I'm not going to waste a lot of time trying to troubleshoot a problem that's not there anymore. So I parked the truck. And the truck sat for another couple weeks. Yesterday after work, I loaded the garbage in the back of the truck to take it to the dump, started the truck, it started fine, went down the driveway, got on the road, and the problem had come back. So the problem I'm experiencing is almost as if there's a problem with the throttle body not opening enough, or there's a problem with the accelerator pedal, it's not getting the right signal. That's what it seemed like to me. I could mash the pedal all the way to the floor and the truck wouldn't rev any more than 4,000 RPM. And that was my first thought. So, okay, I've got a problem either the throttle body uh, or more than likely the uh, gas pedal itself has an issue. And in this truck, there's no cable between the gas pedal and the uh, throttle. It's just, it's all electronic. So it's electric signal. And in my head, I'm thinking, well, maybe there's a follow-up or a potentiometer or a wire or something between the throttle, the uh, gas pedal and the engine control and the throttle body that's not working right. So that's where I was kind of leaning on going with this problem. So I decided not to go to the dump, brought the truck back, parked it in the driveway, and um, got my scan tool on, and I scanned it for faults. And three faults came up. The first fault was a P0453 powertrain evaporative emission control system, pressure sensor high. Um, that problem's been there for a while, and I just been ignoring it. I didn't want to spend the money on something that was, you know, part of a emissions. And we don't have emissions testing here, so rather than dump money into it, waste a lot of time, I would just overlook that. But the problems that I noticed that were new on this was a P1441 powertrain, which could be any multiple issues, and P2440 powertrain secondary air injection system switch valve stuck open bank one. So I'm kind of trying to figure out, like, well, what, does, what do these two problems have to do with the fact that I can't get my truck to go above 30 miles an hour or 4,000 RPM? Went online. I'm doing Google like everybody does, and I'm having difficulties finding anything particular related to this truck that could be causing a problem with a uh, gas pedal and how that could be rela related to uh, being RPM limited and what these two faults mean. So I happened to go into a Toyota group and somebody had posted a 2006 uh, service manual for this truck. And I spent a couple hours last night uh, going through the service manual using control F and typing in my codes to see how these codes could be related to the problem I'm having with my uh, uh, acceleration, why the trucks just flat out won't go. And what I found is I found that the P2440 powertrain secondary air injection system and the P1441 were related. 
And what happens when the vehicle throws those codes is that you, your throttle now becomes limited. The engine control just won't let you go fast in a truck. So that solved my problem with why the truck won't go fast. Now from here on out, I've got to determine what my problem is that's actually throwing those codes. I decided to move my little video operation up onto my front porch. So last night, I went and I got the PDF of the service manual for a 2006 Toyota Tundra and it's like a 5,000 page document. I was able to go and find it on a Google Drive. Uh, there was a link that was in a Tundra forum that somebody was nice enough to, to put up there and I downloaded it. And I spent a couple hours last night going through it trying to find what could cause my problems. Uh, the fail safe, there's a, in the diagnostic section of the Tundra manual, page DI465, there's a chart. It's a fail-safe chart. And the chart lists the DTC codes, and it lists a fail-safe operation and a fail-safe deactivation condition. Uh, for example, you can turn the ignition switch off and it deactivates the fail-safe condition. Uh, but for my codes, the P1441 and the, and the P2440, if I just had a P1441, the fail-safe operation would be restrict the throttle opening angle GA less than equal to 100 GP, G per S and I'm assuming that's grams per second, I don't think it's gallons um, so it restricts it down to 100 G per second but since I have a P1441 <coughs> and a P2440 code at the same time it's different. Fail-safe operation for both those codes or a, a P2440 with a P1444, restricted throttle opening angle, GA less than equal to 30 G per S. So it's one third of what it would be if it was just 1441. And that sounds about like what my truck's doing. It's, it's just not getting any RPMs. I was able to go through and find in the, the service manual under Diagnostics, page 746, they, uh, or, excuse me, Diagnostics, page 739, they have one whole page designated to the 1441, 1444, and 2440 codes. Well, I hope that shows up right. <laughs> it's not backwards. Uh, my little video monitor is turned around so I can see it, and of course, everything I hold up to it looks like it's backwards. Um, but anyway, the DTCs 1441, 1444, and 2440 all involve the secondary air injection system switching valve. Number two, it's either stuck open on bank one or stuck open on bank two. So when it talks about the trouble areas, it gives several of them depending upon it's a 1441 or 2440, but some of them overlap. The overlapping ones could be a VSV for air injection system bank one and or two is it causing a problem. Air switching valve number two, bank one and or two. Uh, and that the reason it says and or one or and or two is that that 2440 is common to both the P1441, which was a uh, bank one, and 1444, which is a bank two uh, being stuck open. It could be an air injection driver, air injection driver circuit, it could be an ECM, or it could be electronic electromagnetic air switching valve could be causing a problem. So I took a look and I was able to find some uh, procedures for testing those items in the manual. Uh, Diagnostics page 746 give a test, gives a test procedure for checking the air switching valve operation. Of course the first step in doing that, the preparation is to remove the intake manifold. It appears that what Toyota did on this 4.7 V8 engine is they put a lot of this stuff that could be causing my problem underneath the intake manifold. And when I say it's underneath the intake manifold, I'm not talking like reach your fingers around the side to get to it. I'm talking like you have to remove the intake manifold off the top of the engine to get to these items. There is a couple things I could check without having to take the intake manifold. Uh, the emissions control section in the manual, page EC18, gives a procedure for secondary air injection system on vehicle inspection. 
where you can inspect the VSV part of the air injection system and that's mounted on top of into the side of the intake manifold and it gives resistance readings uh, if you can if you have a vacuum tester you can connect a vacuum test little kind of little handle that you squeeze and you can use it to apply a vacuum and apply some voltage and see if this valve is opening and closing I'm gonna hit that first because that's an easy item and it doesn't require that I start disassembling my engine to check it but I'll do a check on that and uh, who knows maybe I get lucky maybe that's my problem Oh, one other thing, the ECM on this, according to the uh, shop manual, is behind the glove box. And it, and it does give a pinout, let me hold that up, a pinout on the ECM. So I should be able to go from the ECM on some of this stuff and uh, read through to my VSV uh, for the air injection system problem. Looking under the hood here, 4.7 V8 I-Force engine. This is my intake manifold. Everything is buried under this. This would have to come out to get to most of the items that are part of this secondary air system. One of the easy things to get to is right here. It's a VSV. You've got a bank one and a bank two. I'm not sure which is which. I'd have to take a look in the manual. But I can get to this item easily. And I can do some functional checks on it, voltage checks, operational checks, vacuum checks to see if it's working. And I'm hoping, got my fingers crossed, that if there's a problem, it's going to be this. Here's a bit better view. I moved the camera over a little bit. So I've got my two vacuum valves here. And there's a silicone hose here, and it appears to be in good condition. Silicone hose here appears to be in good condition. There's a metal tube that runs across the top of this bracket between these two valves. There's the hose that goes up underneath the intake manifold. Uh, this hose here went to a plastic box that's between my air filter and my throttle body. And I've got two more hoses here that go into this nylon sleeve and they run around the back side of the engine just on top of the block between the firewall and the intake manifold and I've got to see where they go and make sure that those are in good condition. So these two vacuum hoses go around here back behind the intake manifold. It appears that one of them hooks up to some kind of a valve that I really can't see or get my hand on. And the other one passes by and I'm going to make an assumption that it too hooks up to a valve uh, similar to the valve that's on this closest side to me. So to get to that stuff I would have to take the uh, intake manifold off so I'm going to stop at that point chasing that down. I'm going to work my way through the best I can the secondary air injection system inspection that I've got out of the emissions control section of the uh, Tundra manual, manual. And what this says is it says to check for voltage at this connector on the back of the engine computer. And to get access to that, you just take your glove box down. There's uh, two screws that hold the door on the glove box, and then there's three screws around the inside cover and a light and once you take that down you can get access to the back of this ECM and I'm pinned in on pins AIP and E2 and the procedure says to uh, pin in turn the ignition switch on don't start the vehicle I'm looking for 1.0 to 2.2 volts got my multimeter set up here and let's turn the key on. Key's on. And I've got 2.62 volts. So my voltage is a little bit higher than specified. I'm using, not using a calibrated meter, but I'm going to guess that maybe this is okay. So the next step in the uh, secondary injection system on vehicle inspection is to inspect the VSVs, <clears throat> disconnect the connectors, and they want you to take a uh, resistance reading. One of the first things I'll, I do is I take a look at the condition of the pins inside the connector and on the VSV itself, and I look for corrosion, and that looks pretty good. That one there looks pretty good. Need to get a light up in here. 
and those pins look good and the pins on that look good so I've got the uh, VSVs disconnected and I've got my meter set in just like it's shown and I should have resistance between pins 1 and 2 there's only two pins on this it should be between 33 and 39 ohms at 68 degrees Fahrenheit it's about 45 and raining here so I'm not too sure exactly what my reading should be but it should be close to that and then you also need to check between pin 1 and a ground and pin 2 and a ground to see if there's a wire maybe chafed and shorted to the chassis somewhere so I've, I'm hooked in I got some jumper leads on my cables are hooked in and I'm reading 34.2 and when I disconnect from one of them and go to a chassis ground right here is good uh, I'm not showing any continuity so it appears I don't have any shorts uh, I could use a mega on this but I don't have one here I've, I've got one at my shop but I'm gonna go with that if I don't have any continuity there's not any corrosion or shorting issues inside that uh, VSV that could be getting a signal loss going to ground and then I'll go and I'll go and I'll check the uh, I'll check the aft one hooked into the aft VSV and I've got a reading of 33.8 so it's within the allowable tolerances given in the manual so the next step is to disconnect the vacuum lines and see if you get airflow through the uh, uh, vacuum fitting on the valve it doesn't specify between flow between both ports it just says check that the air does not flow from the port as shown in the illustration and the port port it's pointing to is pointing to the port that's closest to the connector well on the bottom side of this there appears to be some kind of a vent filter and when I hook up a hose to the port closest to the, the valve body I can get air blowing through it and it comes out this little cover at the bottom my my, my uh, valves not mounted like this it's my valves kind of mounted uh, straight up and down like this and it does it on both valves now the top port when I blow into it or, or the left port as shown in this picture uh, I'm not getting any airflow both valves do the same thing when they're hooked up I don't know if this procedure is written very well or not or if this procedure is correct but I do get airflow blowing in through this port as shown with the arrow on both of them and the way I've done that is I've got it loose here and I've got the, the hoses off of both of the valves and I got myself a piece of vacuum hose here and I could just blow in to this hose or suck on it and see what I see what kind of fl a flow through the valve I'm getting so when I blow on the top one it's tight when I blow on the bottom one I don't know if the camera's picking that up or not but I get airflow through it and it appears to be coming through that filtered cover that cylind cylindrical filtered cover on the uh, bottom of the valve and it does it on both the valves next step is to hook a 9 volt power source in between pins one and two on the valve and what I'm going to use is I've got a little uh, a little nine volt battery this nine volt battery should have an, enough oomph to get the uh, solenoid inside the valve to click and hook up the battery you should hear the solenoid click and then you should be able to blow air between the two vacuum ports on the valve so I'm going to give that a try And I don't think the valve really cares which is positive, which is negative. It's just an electrical coil. So I'll hook up one side. I can hear that clicking. I don't know if the camera's picking it up or not. But that, that solenoid valve's definitely working as far as electrically. So I've got my battery hooked up. Set my battery off to the side. I can blow through the uh, between the two ports no problem at all so the aft 
Solenoid valve check good. Let me hook my 9 volt battery into the Ford solenoid valve and see what I get. Nothing. Okay, it appears that my solenoid's dead. But before I make that determination, let me go back to my other solenoid valve and make sure that my setup is still working correctly. And I got nothing on that one. So between, so in the process of checking the uh, aft solenoid valve, it appears that my little 9 volt battery voltage has dropped below the threshold where it will pull the uh, solenoid. So I've got to put that back on charge. I had to upgrade to a little bit bigger battery. It's a little Cabela's Outdoor uh, Sport battery. Um, generally, I don't like having to use something with this much amps behind it because I don't have a circuit breaker or fuse or anything in with the wiring. But I don't have anything else to use right now, and I, I don't, I don't want to try to hook it into the uh, truck battery. So let me see what happens now when I check my little vacuum solenoid here. And I'm hooking up. Click, 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 click. It appears to be electrically operating. And when I hook my test hose in, I can blow through it. So, unfortunately for me, both of these valves check good. I was kind of hoping I'd find one of them bad because where this is heading now is this is all heading up underneath that intake manifold. And I'm not looking forward to having to dig under there. Okay, the next check is to, in uh, to inspect the number two air switching valve. And this is located behind the intake manifold, up underneath the intake manifold. And what they recommend is they recommend that you take a vacuum, uh, hand vacuum pump and you apply a vacuum to it and make sure it holds the vacuum. And then when you release the vacuum, you should hear the valve make a popping sound afterwards. Well, I can't find my hand operated uh, vacuum pump more than likely last time I used it it pissed me off and I threw it in the trash so I'm gonna do this uh, just by mouth and see what I can uh, find checking between the uh, uh, the two uh, uh, air switching valves on the back of the uh, uh, engine the service manual shows hooking in a hand vacuum tester to the hose that goes to the switching valve on the back side of the engine here and that's just too hard for me to get up in the engine compartment because I'm gonna have to do this by mouth so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna attach my quarter inch hose here at the top of this known good switching valve and suspected good uh, air switching valve at the back of the engine and I'm just gonna suck on the end of the hose a little bit and I'm gonna see what kind of vacuum it's gonna hold of course to do this I have to energize the solenoid valve here with my test battery. So let's see what I can get. I don't know if you could see that in the picture. I was able to get enough vacuum on that hose to stick my tongue onto the end of it. Let me try that again. Yeah, that's a uh, definitely hold the vacuum and when I when I take my tongue off the end of the hose after applying uh, vacuum I can hear the the pop it inside that switching valve on the back of the engine release so I'm gonna move this over to the one that's throwing the code now that I got a, a, a test valve checked and I can I can see what what it should do hook this in without arcing anything okay I can hear the solenoids pulled and let me try this uh, this other valve I can feel it wants to pull a bit of a vacuum but it's really it's really not holding much it's very very weak and the hose, uh, the hose won't even hardly stick it into my tongue, uh, so I'm not hearing a a pop it sound on this valve when I apply a vacuum and then then let the vacuum off on it. So it appears that my problem in this case is going to be that um, air switching valve, which is located conveniently up underneath the intake manifold. So at this point, it looks like I'm going to have to pull an intake manifold 
to replace the valve back under back under here here's a pretty good diagram out of the service manual that shows what I'm dealing with so here's my engine block here's my intake manifold this air pump assembly it's shown in the picture towards the back of the engine but this actually mounts up under here and the air switching valves that I'm dealing with they're shown towards the front of the engine in the picture but they're actually mounted back over in this corner here and here's my switching valve that I've been testing the hoses that go around to these to these air switching valves here so to get to this I'm gonna to have to remove this and I'm not looking forward to it but there's no other way to replace this valve without pulling this up I'm in, I'm in the process now of removing the uh, intake manifold and I took the throttle body loose left the uh, coolant lines connected to it so I don't have to drain the radiator hopefully I won't have to drain the radiator I'm leaving the injector manifolds on I'm disconnecting all the connectors off the injectors so I'm gonna see if I can get this manifold off here with doing a middle minimal amount of disassembly on the manifold itself over on this side here I've got my uh, fuel line disconnected a bag placed over it I probably need to put some kind of a cover or something or cap on here to keep crap out of it but I'm slowly just looking to see what do I have to disconnect that'll free up my uh, intake manifold with the minimal amount of removal of parts looks like I can leave these uh, VSVs on and I really won't know until I get to the back here uh, what's going to be the hold up on that so I've got the uh, hardware out from around the uh, base of the intake manifold and right now my intake manifold is loose it's about ready to come up but there's something going on here at the back of the manifold that's uh it's still hung up a little bit and looks to me like there's a wiring harness back here that's there's a bolt that attaches this wiring harness bracket to the back of the intake manifold And I'm not sure what's going on around on this corner. I'm going to have to get a flashlight and a mirror to see. But I'm just hung up right now at the back side. So there was a bolt back here that attached this wiring harness to the back of the intake manifold. I got it out of the way. I'm trying to lift it up. And I happen to notice there's a line that comes off the left fuel rail. And it goes on over. And it eventually drops down where that plastic bag is so I've got the line disconnected it it's like a, a metal line up to where the hose is and then it goes into the hose and I can kind of feel there's some flex to it like it's a plastic line I don't want to bend this line too much but this is trapped underneath this wiring harness here so I think the safe thing to do is to disconnect the connectors and free up this wiring harness from I guess it goes up here where the, I would say the alternator, but that's not the alternator. It's some kind of a, I guess it's some kind of a, a connector at maybe a uh, valve timing sensor, crankshaft position sensor. But I'm going to free up all this wiring here, and then I can just kind of throw it up to the side, and that should get this line here free. Uh, I just don't want to flex it and bend it too much and then find out it's plastic and I've cracked something and I've got a leak and I've got to spend more money and it's just easier for me at this point to kind of slow down a little bit and get some other things out of my way. I've got the wiring harness is uh, loosened up and I've got my fuel line is now on the intake side of this harness and what I found was I didn't have to take the harness completely loose. Matter of fact, down here where my hand is, there's a connector that's buried underneath something that I can't even get to. So some of this stuff you can kind of leave on. Uh, there's a connector down here at the tip of my finger that can stay on. 
there's a connector over here that hooks up to this harness that has to get thrown over the top. That needs to get disconnected. And there's a couple clamps on the front of this timing chain cover. And what you'll need to do to get these clamps loose is right there where the tip of my finger is, when this is closed, it snaps over and it latches that harness into the clamp. If you get a thin screwdriver into that area where my finger is and just kind of push it and twist a little bit, this thing will unsnap and you can then open it. There's a clamp here and then there's one down below this area and they work the same way. Once I got these clamps open and I got this harness loose at the front, it gave me enough slack to pull everything over the top of the front of the cam cover here and then I just was able to get it thrown up over the top this direction and fish this out from underneath without bending it uh, too much. So let's see what this gets me now. Okay, this took me a bit to find out what I'm catching on. This is looking down at the right rear corner of the intake manifold and you'll see, oh, let me see if I can get my finger up in there. Right here to tip my finger is there's one nut that holds the intake manifold and what I'm pointing at here that has the bolt in it, that's part of the bracket that's holding the wiring harness that goes around the back side of the intake manifold. And the reason I can't get this up is that bracket is catching on the corner of the ear where I've taken the nut off. So I'm going to have to take this bolt out, loosen up this bracket here, and then I should, at this point, be able to get my intake manifold out. There it is. I got the intake manifold off. Um, the job looked a bit harder than it it actually was just because there's so much stuff in the way and I probably could have done this in a lot less time uh, easily one third of my time was spent trying to figure out what the hell was being caught up here at the back side of the intake manifold but this is the uh, driver's side and a couple fuel lines take out the injectors leaves the rails in place pull the throttle body off there was a couple items that were bolted here on the top of the intake manifold and I just got them out of my way to make it easier to work with. The uh, hose was here, two hoses here. Looking at the right side, the solenoid valve assembly, I had to pull this out of my way because down in this area here are where the bolts are that hold this uh, intake manifold on and it's really hard to get tooling past here so I just kind of took this out of the way threw it off to the side and then just uh, put it back up after I got everything pulled loose small vacuum line there this is the corner over here that had a bracket that was that the wiring harness goes across the back here and there's a bracket here that was catching this ear once I got that bracket loose that wiring harness was able to get pushed back the wiring harness there's two connectors here, this, this firewall's here, so you reach your hand in here and there's one connector up top, you pull it out of the way, and there's a bolt that holds that wiring harness bracket in place, and the bracket pretty much comes all the way around over to here, and it's in this area where my hand is. But you've got to take a bolt out over on this side and a bolt out over here, and then that whole harness bracket will kind of push back out of the way. Once I got that taken care of, this thing popped right up. On the inside here, there's orange uh, seals. I'm going to replace these. Yeah, they need to get replaced. You can kind of see I'm getting some corrosion in here. I'll clean some of this stuff up before it goes back together. So this has gotten me access to my air switching valve at this point. Also, here's some of the other items that I removed. There's that uh, intake duct. Of course, there's all the bolts and hardware that are for the intake manifold. A couple brackets that were on top of the engine. Bolts that hold the throttle body on. This little vacuum item here, I don't even know what it is. Another hose. This clip here is what secures the fuel line that's attached to the intake manifold. This fuel line, this clip comes out, it'll probably fall down on the ground when you take it loose. So back in the engine compartment, this is a secondary air pump. Goes into a valve here, it looks like some kind of a valve or pressure switch. 
I'm looking at this item here and I'm thinking, don't tell me that's the friggin' starter. I'm hoping it's not a starter. And the valves that I need to get to that are causing me trouble are all the way back here. So my intake manifold's right where my hand is. There's this, this wiring harness plastic bracket that goes around the back of the engine. That's in the way of getting access to these items here. Now, I don't know if I could have maybe pulled this harness and got it out of the way. I don't know. I doubt it. But there's are my two uh, air valves are at. And I believe it's this one on the left side that's causing me some trouble. But I'll get to that next and take it apart. I'm going to have to do some cleaning in here. I have to put some rags down into the uh, intake. And I want to get rid of some of this crap that's built up. You can see it's getting some corrosion and crud and all kinds of whatnot in there. So I've got this part. I'll do some cleaning on it. Maybe put some corrosion treatment on it. You can see my heads are all oxidizing. Truck's 15 years old. I've never had a vehicle that rust, rust as bad as this 2006 Tundra. I'm looking at rust on the frame and the body, and I'm thinking, you know, 1970s GM would be proud of these people. They're really carrying on in their footsteps. But that's neither here nor there. So I can get access to my valve, pull my valves on out, and take a look and see what the problem is. Well, I got the valve off. Um, it's a little bit difficult reaching between the firewall and that uh, plastic bracket that holds the wire that go across the back side of the engine. What you're going to need to do the job is just a quarter inch drive, a short um, 10 millimeter socket, and then you're going to need a long 10 millimeter on an extension to get your to get this uh, valve loose. And I've got the valve out here. And Let's see if I can't get this position right. So this goes on the left side of the engine and here's an outlet that has a stainless steel line that goes to looks like the exhaust and then there's this intake to this valve and there's a couple long bolts that hold it to a manifold and the manifold is part of your secondary air system so I've got this out and I've got a hose attached to this and I've been trying to duplicate um, the operation of the good valve with this one out and when I suck on the hose it's not really building up a good pressure and I'm not hearing this valve the pop it and the valve activate so I don't know if the problem is that I've got a, a problem with the diaphragm's got a leak in it or if the shaft on the poppets froze up or the poppet itself is froze up but looking at this it doesn't look to me like there's there's really anything I can do with it it's this diaphragm looks like it's sealed on the end it's crimped down with this cover there's a couple screws here I could take this loose but I think at this point I'm gonna end up uh, doing just a replacement on this I thought of taking off the other uh, valve and doing a little suction demo here in front of the camera but my back and the back of my legs and my arms and my hands uh, they convinced me forget it they'll just have to take your word on it that uh, that valve is working properly After I troubleshot it to a, a faulty air valve, I went back in the house, went on Amazon, ordered a replacement valve on Amazon. It was about $90, free shipping. Of course, they added taxes to it. And that was on Saturday. Here it is, uh, Monday afternoon after work, and I've already got the valve here in my hand. I've got my hose hooked up, and I'm going to apply some vacuum to it. When I apply vacuum to it, looking into this end, not the end that's adjacent to this port, but the very end of it opposite the diaphragm. When I apply vacuum, I can actually see the poppet inside of that moving outwards this direction. And when I apply the vacuum and let it go, you can hear the poppet snapping back in place. So I'm going to hold this up close to the uh, camera. Hopefully you'll be able to hear the sound of the poppet when I uh, let the vacuum off. Here's a big clunk. Here it is again. So that's the sound your valve should make when you release the vacuum. The good valve on the truck, I could hear that without having to pull it off the back of the engine. This one here, I couldn't hear it, 
well not this one but the bad valve that I'm replacing with this valve I couldn't hear it I got the valve out I applied vacuum to it saw no movement on the pop inside uh, so it was totally toast got my new valve I'm gonna go ahead and put this back in right now I'm waiting on a gasket to come in for my uh, intake manifold so I'll get this on tonight and maybe the next couple days I'll get the gasket in for the intake manifold and I can start reassembling that So it's a week later right now. I ordered a set of uh, replacement intake gaskets from Amazon. It cost me about 20 bucks for both sets for the left and right side of the intake manifold. I'm down to the point now where I just pop these gaskets out, start putting the intake manifold back together, and get this engine wrapped up. Intake manifold dropped in nicely. I've got my fuel line rounded underneath this wiring harness. Get the uh, nuts on the intake manifold, attach them to the uh, engine block, come around the back and get this um, wiring harness re-bolted to the back side of the intake manifold. I've got my intake manifold on and the factory service manual says to torque the intake manifold to the cylinder head bolts to 13 foot-pounds. I was able to do that with a small quarter inch torque wrench. This one will go up to 200 inch-pounds. So 13 foot-pounds, 156 inch-pounds. The shop manual does not give a torque sequence for the intake manifold. The intake manifold's plastic, and they do say to step torque it up to 13 foot-pounds. And step torque means starting off at something like uh, uh, 5 foot-pounds, going to 10 foot-pounds, and then going to your final torque. And one of the things you're going to want to do when you put this intake manifold is on is you're not going to want to start in one corner and just start torquing your way around the intake manifold. It's best to start and torque it in a cross pattern. And usually when you see how something's installed, any type of a, a, a head or anything with a gasket that has a lot of bolts in it, usually they start at the middle. And then they have you start each side in the middle, then you jump up one, go over to the other one, jump back down, go up on the opposite side. So you're kind of torquing in an X across the center of whatever it is that you're torquing. Once you get to the final torque, 13 foot pounds or 156 inch pounds, one of the things I always do, and I've learned this over the years, is don't just assume that you've torqued every single bolt where it, need, where it needs to be. Start at one corner and go in a row, all the way down, go across the other side, go all the way back up again, and then stop and retorque that first bolt you just started uh, that you started with when you did the uh, torque in a sequence. And what you want to do is you want to make sure you didn't miss any. And it's very easy to miss a torque on something. There it is. Everything's back together. Engine's running smooth. No problems. Don't see anything leaking. And the best part. Get that. No fault code. Done one scan. I started it, shut it down, started it again, and here's I've got my problem fixed. I put the truck back together last Saturday. This is the following Friday. I was going to try to wrap up this video at that point there. Uh, Monday night I had a little accident where I uh, had a ladder slide up from underneath me and uh, I got a uh, broken foot. I started putting the engine together on the truck last Saturday morning at about 8 o'clock. It took me about four hours to put my intake manifold on and to get everything reconnected and glove box in, everything back together and get the truck started and worked fine. I loaded everything up by 1 o'clock. I was on the way to the dump and had no issues at all with the truck. There was the code, the P0453 which was my evaporative canister. I had fixed the wiring on that. So that code is gone. And of course, there were the two codes that were related to the secondary air intake uh, valve that was bad. And those were all cleared. The truck's working fine right now. This job wasn't as difficult as I initially thought it would be. I know this video is a little bit on the long side. I tried to cover all the steps that I took doing this uh, in accordance with the uh, factory service manual. So that made it a little bit long. But I would say if I had to do this job again, I could probably have the thing troubleshot in about an hour 
and I could probably have the intake manifold and everything disconnected in about maybe two hours, two and a half hours, I can have that off and have access to that valve. And then putting it back together again, um, didn't take me about a half an hour to put the valve on and then put the intake manifold back on. Of course, I was working an issue with a wiring problem for the P0453 issue and that took me most of my morning. Uh, so maybe I could have had this intake manifold back on again in less than an hour and a half. Uh, the job's not that difficult. If you guys have a problem like this, watch my video and take some notes and you should be able to go through the troubleshooting procedure as I've shown it and get your truck fixed in no time. Thanks for watching. Take care.